We've been shaped by stories our entire lives. When we were younger, they were read to us at bedtime. They come from our teachers in class and friends in hallways. We see them in our favorite movies and TV shows. We relate to them, visualize them, and share them. Jesus understood this and chose to teach through stories. We've been shaped by stories our entire lives, but the stories told by Jesus were meant to give us life. His stories were called parables. Well, good morning, Hope Church. How are we doing this morning? We're doing well? We're doing good? Man, so excited to have you. What an amazing time of worship this morning. Can we just give it up for Hope Worship? I mean, honestly, just amazing. I feel like there's Sundays like that. I could just walk up here, pray, and we could all just go home, right? I mean, it's just, it just amazing, amazing time. And so, man, we are so glad that you are here. So glad that you've chosen to be with us. As Alex said, if you are a guest with us, I, I just really want to say this. Thank you for hanging out with us. Thank you for being here. I cannot imagine what it must be like going to church for the very first time somewhere. You know, I, I think we take for granted so often when you have a church that you regularly attend, uh, just the emotion it must take to come to a place that you know nothing about, you don't know any people, there's all these stereotypes and all these preconceived ideas about church and church people and all these things, and, and they're coming to a place not knowing what they're going to ask you to do, where they're going to ask you to park or sit, or if they're going to point you out, and you're coming in, and you don't know what to expect. I know it takes a lot, and so I just want to say thank you for entrusting us this morning to be with us. Thank you for taking time out of your schedule to give us a try. We really do hope that you have a great experience here at Hope Church. I would love for this church to become your home, for you to set up uh, roots here, for you and your family to, to come to this church and, and call this place home. And we always say this, and I mean this, if you come here today and you're, and you're trying church out and you just decide we're not the church for you, but you're looking for something, we'll help you find a place. There's some great churches in this community. We would love to help you just find a church home to get your family set up in, rooted into. And so if you're online this week and you're watching this, listen to our podcast, tuning in, I say the same for you. We would love for you to come sometime, check us out, come into a service. But thank you for tuning in. God continues to just expand our influence in this community to grow our ministry. We don't take it for granted. Uh, we made a commitment to God a long time ago. The, the more uh, that he would increase our platform, the more that we would just continue to lift up his name unashamedly and to make much of the name of Jesus. And we're going to continue to do that. And so again, we're just glad that you're with us today. We are in the third week of a teaching series called Parables. And a parable is basically just a short story. Uh, Jesus taught in parables, and, and what, what Jesus basically did is he would teach in, in this story form just so he could make a, a very deep, maybe biblical truth or some point that he was trying to convey so he can make it applicable. He would tell it in a story because he knew stories were such a powerful way to be able to communicate to people. Because a story had the power to be able to bring people in from all different walks of life. So Jesus could speak to somebody who, who grew up in church the whole life. At the same time, he was speaking to somebody who, who had no church affiliation. He was speaking to the crowd of people who, who some of them were followers of Jesus, and some of them didn't even believe in Jesus to the skeptics and doubters. And so uh, Jesus would tell these stories to just kind of bring everybody in. And we're going to kind of see him begin to do that again today. But Jesus is going to tell a story today of really what I believe, what, he, what he's trying to convey to us, is really what it looks like to be a follower of his. Really, the heart we're supposed to have. And so if you are a guest with us, if you are someone here today that's tuning in, and maybe you're skeptical about Christians and church and followers of Jesus, it's a great opportunity for me to just kind of convey to you really what it's supposed to look like for us to be followers of Jesus. Now, I'll be honest with you, we're not always going to get it right because we're not perfect people and we're not Jesus. But I'm going to kind of lay out for you really what Jesus desires for his people. So if you have a Bible view today, I want you to go ahead and get to Luke chapter 10. We're going to be in verses 25 through 37 today. I want to remind you, if you don't own a Bible, that is always our gift to you. We would love for you to have your own Bible. And so we give them away for free every week out in our lobby. You can go out to our next steps there, grab a Bible on your way out. Nobody's going to ask you to do anything. You just grab a free Bible. Um, if you want to have a free Bible with you all times, you can download the Bible app on your phone or your tablet. If you're at home watching this or whatever, you can do that anytime you want. If you don't want to do any of that, again, we say this every week, we'll do all the work for you. We'll put all of it on the screens for you in the house and at home so you can follow along with us. And so we're going to begin in Luke 10, verse 25. And I said, and behold, a lawyer stood up to him, as in Jesus, to test him, saying, teacher, what shall I do to in inherit eternal life? And so Jesus is in a room with some people, and a lawyer stands up in the room, and he asks Jesus a question. He says, Jesus, 
What's it going to take for me to, to, to inherit eternal life? What's it going to take for me to be in heaven one day? What's it going to take for me to live beyond this life? And Jesus said to him, what is written in the law? How do you read it? In verse 27, the lawyer answers him and said, that you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your strength, and with all of your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said to him, you have answered correctly. Do this, and you will live, right? So this lawyer is going to ask you a, a very difficult question because you have to understand, to give you some context, during this day in Jewish law, there are about 622 laws. They had taken the Ten Commandments, the law that we know, thou shalt not kill or, and murder, and I have any other gods before me, and they had added about 612 laws to the Ten Commandments. So he says, Jesus, what's the most important law? What's the law really about? Jesus will later come back and really teach a whole message about this. And so he's asked this guy, what's it about? And the guy responds. He says, really, I guess it's about loving God with all of your mind and soul and strength and your heart and loving your neighbor. And Jesus says, that's exactly right. Now, there are a lot of people in our culture today who would look at a message like this, look at Jesus' teaching. You've heard people say, well, when Jesus spoke this message, what he did is he was nullifying the law, right? He was nullifying the Ten Commandments, and he was dumbing it down and simplifying it. And I'd say, no, he, he didn't nullify the Ten Commandments. He's actually elevating the Ten Commandments. He's actually simplifying. He's, he's hyper-focusing what the Ten Commandments are really about. He's saying all of this is about two things. We're to love God and we're to love people. Take the Ten Commandments. Hard to love people when you're murdering them, right? Hard to love people when you steal from them, right? Hard, hard to love people when you're coveting somebody else's wife, right? Hard to love God when you have something else in front of God. Hard to love God when you're taking God's name in vain. And so you think about the Ten Commandments, he's saying, listen, it all boils down to this. You're to love God with all that you have in you, and you're to love people the way that God has loved you. And so the mission for us is to love God. Like I would tell you, nothing in your life will ever make sense until you begin a relationship with God. You'll never have true hope or purpose or fulfillment or contentment in this life. No job will do it for you. No title will do it for you. No amount of success or money will do it for you. Until you find it in God, you will never find what you're really looking for in this life. And until we begin to learn how to show love to people, then the world will never really know who God is. The world knows who God is because he see it through us. Can I be honest with you? There are a lot of organizations that exist in our world, church organizations, nonprofit organizations. There are a lot of people, a lot of people who love people, but they don't love God, right? And sadly, there are a lot of organizations, and sadly, there are a lot of so-called Christians in churches who say they love God, but don't appear to love people. So Jesus says, it's a perfect marriage of the two. You got to love God and you got to love people. And when you bring those two together, you expose my heart to the world. You show people what I'm really about. But if you separate either one of those, then you, you're doing an injustice to what my father sent me to do. This is about loving him and loving people. And so this lawyer, very wise lawyer, very smart lawyer, he wants to try to catch Jesus. And so in verse 29, he asks him a question. He says, but desiring to justify himself, he said to Jesus, and who's my neighbor? And who is my neighbor? I would encourage you, if you're taking some notes, just to underline the word who for just a second. He's saying, who is it? Who's my neighbor, Jesus? What's that look like? Who am I supposed to love? What does that look like for me? Am I supposed to love my enemy? Am I supposed to love these people? Am I supposed to love some person? Who am I supposed to love? And Jesus says, well, let me tell you a story. And so Jesus re replies back in beginning in verse 30, and he says this. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers, who stripped and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion he went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal. In some versions, it'll say donkey, and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, take care of him. And, what, and whatever more you spend, I'll repay you when I come back. And Jesus asked this question. 
Which of these do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? The lawyer said, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said, you go and do likewise. Now, I've told you before that Jesus is a master storyteller. So when Jesus is picking the characters that he would tell in the story, understand he knows exactly what he is about to do. So a priest and a Levite would have been two people who would have had just kind of, kind of a, a very local name. They had a title in the community, very well respected. I mean, the priest is the guy who's, who's leading the temple, in charge of the temple. And a Levite was basically like an associate pastor. He was the guy who assisted the priest. So two very well respected, very well saw men. Two men, as Jesus is telling the story, would have been the men that you would have thought that would have stopped to help this guy. So you have a guy, a Jewish man, who is traveling down uh, from Jerusalem to Jericho. Along the journey, he's beat up, he's stripped naked, he's thrown into a ditch, he's left to die. Jesus is telling this story, a priest is coming along. You're hearing Jesus tell the story, and you're thinking, well, surely the priest is going to do his job. He's supposed to care for people. And it says the priest saw this man, quickly got to the other side of the road, and left him in the ditch. Likewise, a Levite came by, right? And you're thinking, well, here's a Levite. He's going he's to do what the priest could. Maybe the priest was really busy. Levite's responsibility is to help alleviate some of the, the pressure the priest feels. He's going to do the priest's job. And a Levite, other side. And Jesus says, a Samaritan came along. Now, instantly, this means nothing to us. But in Jewish culture, this would have been a big deal. Because Jews and Samaritans hated one another. For hundreds of years, there have been great uh, a war taking place, great division between the Samaritans and the Jews. The Jews looked at the Samaritans, and to them, they were a symbolism of sin and destruction. They were this idea. They almost had this racism against Samaritan people that you just don't touch Samaritans. You don't have conversations with Samaritans. We don't rub shoulders with Samaritans. And for Jesus to use a Samaritan as the hero of the story would have left everybody kind of scratching their head. Why would Jesus do that? Because he's so intentional, so intentional about everything that he was doing. And so what Jesus is going to begin to do, again, is lay out this format, this idea. He's going to give us an example of how we're called to live as followers of Jesus. He's going to say, you really want to follow me? You, you want to attach your name to me? You want a title that says it's your mind? I want to show you how to begin to live. I want to show you what a follower of Jesus is really about. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to grab your note card that you got when you came this morning, and I want you to take some notes with us. We're going to have them on the screens, but I just want you to write down some things that, that Jesus is conveying to us when it comes to being a follower of Jesus. And I believe this is the first thing he's saying, is that followers of Jesus see what others don't. Followers of Jesus have the ability to see what other people cannot see. So again, let's play a little bit of review. Prior to the Samaritan, how many men had passed by this guy laying in a ditch to die? How many people? Two people, right? A priest and a Levite. Two men who by all means should have taken the responsibility to help this man. Two men walked by, and you know what I believe they saw? They saw an inconvenience. I don't have time to stop and help this guy. I mean, his, his needs seem really great. And if I stop to help this guy, I don't know how long it's going to take. And after all, I got places to be. I'm a really important person. I got stuff to do. I got to get to church today. I got things that have got to happen in my life. I don't have time. This is an inconvenience in my life. I don't know how long I'm going to have to stick around and help this guy. I got to get from point A to point B. I do not have the time or the energy to engage in this. So I'm going to get by as fast as I can and hope somebody else comes and do what I don't have time to do, right? And so two men see this as an inconvenience. What separates the Samaritan? He walks by, and what some see as an inconvenience, he sees as an opportunity. Hey, here's a Jew. We don't associate with Jews. They hate us. In fact, they're racist against us. They, they, they sum us up. They have this idea of who we are. I don't care who this guy is. All I know is there's somebody who's in need of help, and I have this responsibility to not pass by, but to get in a ditch with this guy and help this guy at his greatest point of need. I got to get my hands involved in the situation. 
Remember, Jesus is telling the story because the question's been asked, who is my neighbor? And Jesus is trying to draw out this idea that everyone you come in contact with is your neighbor. Everybody. He's saying, well, who? What does it look like? He's saying, everyone that you see, regardless of their political views, they're your neighbor. They're your neighbor. Regardless of their religious views, they're your neighbor. Regardless of their skin color, they're your neighbor. Regardless of their socioeconomic class, they are your neighbor. Regardless of the neighborhood they live in or that, they are your, regardless of how they got to where they are, they are your neighbor. See, we love to kind of inspect, right? We kind of, in our mind, we, we wouldn't call ourselves judgment of people. But when I see someone in need, can I be honest with you? What I struggle with is like, well, I wonder how they got there. I wonder what they did to cause this one themselves. Maybe they should just pull themselves up and get themselves out of that situation. In other words, it's not my problem. It's not my problem. It's not my fault that they are where they are. That's their problem. They got there. And maybe the circumstance could be different. And see, when we allow ourselves to kind of fall into this mentality that it's not my problem, we never expose the heart of God. God said, if you're going to be my follower, if you're really going to be my follower, If you really want to know what it looks like, you're going to love me and you're going to love people the way that I love you. Well, how much did I love you? You were naked in a ditch, dying, and I got involved in your life. You were desperate for somebody, and I stopped to care about your needs. I didn't didn't try to go through my mind and try to figure out why you are the way that you are and why you ended up this way and have conversations in my head about why you deserve to be where you are. I just stopped, and I got my hands dirty because you needed help. I need us to be people who get our hands dirty and we get involved and we help other people. Let's be honest. The priest and Levites, they both had titles. Titles that attached them to God. But neither one of them really exemplified a heart of God. Can I be honest with you? In the church world, we, we, we like to settle with titles. Well, I'm a follower of Jesus. I'm a Christian. I've been a chartered member of a church for the last 50 years. We settle for titles, and we got to be very cautious not to just settle for a title of a Jesus follower without having the heart of a Jesus follower. And so Jesus is saying, this isn't about titles. This is about seeing something seeing differently than everybody else, and seizing the moment, getting your hands involved, getting your hands dirty. So what I'm going to do at each point of this as we walk through this, I'm going to give you what I believe Jesus is telling us that we need to do, but I'm going to give you a follow-up of what we need to ask God to help us with. So here's a follow-up really fast. We need to ask God, we need to ask God to help us see as he sees. It's going to be a daily struggle for us. God, I want to see people the way that you see people. I don't want to just ride around my community and my town and go to school and work and pass right past people and not see people the way that you see people. God, I want to see people the way that you see people. Let me tell you something. It's a scary prayer. You start asking to see people the way that God sees people, and you'll start seeing people the way that God sees people. And God will break your heart for people. God will break your heart for people. It's a prayer that I have to constantly allow myself because I can be the priest and Levi if I can be honest with you. Man, I'm so busy doing God's work. I got good stuff I got to do. I got to get from place to place. I got to get over here that I can look right past God's people. Opportunities he's put in my way that I see so often as inconveniences in my life. God, I want to see as you see Matthew 9 verse 36 says this. When he as in Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion for them. Because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. See, there, there is kind of a two-sided piece to this whole idea of having this, this compassion for somebody. See, we often confuse compassion with just emotion, right? Raw emotion. We see something that breaks our heart, we shed some tears, and we go home and we're like, man, I, I have compassion for that group of people. I have compassion for that sector of the world. I have compassion for people that, that, that are being marginalized in our world today. And then we we just kind of settle with emotion. And sometimes emotion makes us feel better about ourselves, doesn't it? Man, I feel really bad about my life because of something I saw today. But it's kind of two parts. Compassion is is, is an emotion of passion for something. 
And then it's a step further, it's, it's action. Jesus could have looked at us with just some emotion and been like, man, my heart really breaks for those people. Hope somebody comes along and does something for them. And Jesus said, you know what? This is going to compel me to act. I'm going to leave a place of royalty and splendor and majesty in heaven with my Father, and I'm going to put my compassion into action. I'm going to come to this earth. I'm going to lay my life down for people. I'm going to serve people with my life. See, when you and I begin to see as God sees, we'll begin to do as God tells us to do. So we want to have eyes to see like Jesus. See, where most people see inconveniences, we're going to choose to see opportunities. Where most people see outcasts, we're going to choose to see friends. Where most people see hopelessness, we're going to choose to see hope. Where people see sinners, we're going to see grace. Where people see brokenness, we're going to see opportunity and potential for God to restore the brokenness. We're going to choose to see what other people cannot see. We're going to see the best in people. We're not going to judge people who are far from God because they're acting like people far from God. We're going to see the potential of when God gets inside of them, how he can change them and restore them and renew them. And we're going to remember, we're going to remember where we were and who we were and how helpless we were and hopeless we were and what God did for us. We're going to be people who choose to seize those moments. God, I want to see the way that you see. I want to, I want, I want, I want to have eyes to see opportunities around me. Second thing is this, you can write this down. Followers of Jesus, do what others won't. Followers of Jesus, do what others won't do. Again, two men walked by. They did what most people would do. They saw it. Hope nobody saw me because if someone saw me see that, then they thought I would do something about it. So let me get by as fast as I can and kind of ignore it. Maybe I'll get to the next town, and, and maybe I can find somebody to take care of that problem back there that I saw, right? And if we could be honest, in the church world, I've been in ministry a really long time. That's kind of our mentality. People will come to me a lot of times, and they'll say, hey, Tad, my heart breaks with the situation. Hey, I'm bringing this to the church. The church should do something about it. And I'll say this in a lot. You've heard me say this. Hey, God broke your heart. What are you going to do about it? God, God, God showed you that need. Hey, we'll fuel you. We'll resource you. God broke your heart. What are you doing about it? Well, I bring it to the church. No, you are the church. What are you doing about it? We'll, we'll, we'll get behind you, man. We'll, we'll help you in this. But, but God, God's revealed something to you. See, it would have been so easy for the Samaritan to do what these other guys had done, right? Again, he could have got to the next town and said, hey, guys, one of your people, one of your Jewish friends is over there in the ditch dying. Somebody needs to deal with that. He could have been this. He could have been the guy who said, you know what? What I'm going to do is I'm going to go to church this Sunday, and I'm, I'm going to sit down with, with maybe my Sunday school class, and I'm going to have a theological discussion of what we do when we see Jews in a ditch that are dying and they need some help, right? So that next time I see this, 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 this Jew in a ditch that's dying, that, that's been robbed and beaten, I, I'll be better equipped to know how to handle the situation. So what I need right now is I'm ill-equipped for the moment. I don't have the skills. I don't have what it takes. I need some more education, right? I'm just not ready for this moment right now. I'm not ready to engage. Is that what he did? No, he is on the back of his donkey. He's riding into town. He sees this man and instantly. He doesn't process what I can do, what, what I can't do, what I don't know. Do I have what it takes? He just hops off of his donkey and he gets involved in this man's life. What separates the Samaritan from the Levite and priest was that he was willing to get off his donkey and actually do something. Now, you don't have to be like a, a Bible scholar to do some work in the Bible and kind of go back to some of the King James versions in, 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 in old languages to know that a donkey reference in Scripture is reference to something else, right? You know, we all know that, right? There's like a word donkey, and then there's like a whole other word in the English language that describes what a donkey is, right? And so in other words, we could say this way in the church world, that we need to get off our blessed assurance and do something about it, right? <laughs> what separated him from everybody else is that he was willing to get off his donkey and to do something, do something, get started somewhere. Just sitting idle was never an option. I got to get involved. I'm compelled to do something. I got compassion, and my compassion has driven me to get engaged to do something about it. See, the difference between the Samaritan and these two other men is these two other men ran away from this need while this man ran towards the need. I got to get involved. I got to seize this moment. Here's what I would tell you is that the church world today, if we're not careful, 
We can become a bunch of donkey-sitting people. You say, well, I don't ride a donkey to church. And I say, you're exactly right. But let me tell you what a donkey looks like in the church world. It looks like a church seat or a church pew. Doesn't it? Doesn't it? Let's be honest. This is our version of a donkey in our culture. I just, I got too much going on. I'm too busy. We got needs in our community, needs in our world, needs in hate and all those other places. But like, I'm a Christian. I come to church like 32 out of 52 Sundays a year. <laughs> Occasionally I engage in some things, but I'm busy. I got a title, man. I'm a Christian. I gave my heart to Jesus 25 years ago. I go to a small group when I can. I serve a kid. I don't have time, though, to like somebody else is going to have to step up. Hey, are y'all, y'all hearing him preach today? Because there's some needs. And I hope y'all are hearing this message. This is a good message right here. I'm going to go home. We're going to talk about it. But, like, I'm not going to do anything about it. I, I got stuff to do. Like, I got, I got a busy week. I got things going on. I got stuff happening in my life. Hey, you know what? There were years ago that I was one of those crazy people who got involved in everything, but I did my time. It's somebody else's responsibility now. We got a lot of young people in this church. They need to get to it. <laughs> this is what we do, right? Let's be honest. We, we settled for becoming pine riders, bud sitters donkey riders in church. God hasn't called us to just show up to church, attend for an hour a week, check a few religious boxes, and then go back to our lives Monday through Friday. That's not what he, he didn't pull yourself out of this moment. This is a bigger moment. Jesus is saying, listen, there's not about boxes that you check. This is not about you just coming here and giving an hour on a Sunday morning, checking all your spiritual boxes, and you just go back to the life you're trying to create for yourself. He's saying, my followers, they're going to love me with all that they have. You know how much your mind and your soul and your strength and your heart is? That's like everything you got. You're going to love me above everything else. You're going to love me, and you're going to love my people with the same passion. You're going to love people the way that I love people. We're going to be people today who are going to get involved in the problems of the people around us. We're not going to wait for somebody else to come and bring a solution to a problem. We are supposed to have the solution to life's problems. We are sitting on the solution. The greatest answer to questions people are asking is where do I find hope in this life? Where do I find purpose in this life? I'm broken beyond what I believe could ever be repaired. How do I ever find some hope and healing for my life? We have it. It's Jesus, and it's not somebody else's responsibility. It's my responsibility. It's your responsibility. It isn't the umbrella of Hope Church. You and I are the church. We are called to go do something, not to just show up to a place who goes and does all the work. There isn't a bunch of magical elves that show up here during the night and just go do the work in the community, do the work in people's lives. We're called to make a difference. We're called to move past our excuses and our busyness and our lives and to get involved in the work of God, to do what other people are unwilling to do. What I love about this church is we got a bunch of people who are willing to do what other people won't do. And Sally, they do it for many of you every single week. And we are so conditioned to sit back and allow other people just to serve us. We gotta be people today who we allow God to break our hearts to allow us to see life the way that he sees life. See, growing up, I discovered there were a lot of churches and a lot of so-called Christians that were turned off by people's issues. I mean, I, I went to a church. I mean, it was a huge, huge church. Nobody talked about their problems because you didn't talk about problems in church. You put on your Sunday best and you put on your church smile and you come to church and everything's good. How are you doing? I'm great. How are you? I'm great. How are you good, brother? I'm good. Life is good. And people's lives were falling apart. We don't talk about problems. Nobody gets real. The pastor didn't talk about problems. He didn't talk about struggles. He didn't talk about sin. We didn't create an environment in church a long time ago where people were open about what's going on. This is reality. When people get turned off to problems, we get turned on by them. Because we're a church full of problems. Everybody in this room, everybody watching this message, we all have problems. At some point in our life, we all have something in common. We all have found ourselves in hopeless situations, and we've needed hope. And what I love about this church is we've got a group of people who have never forgotten how desperate they were for the hope of Jesus. And that's what fuels us 
in this journey. I'm willing to do things that other people aren't willing to do because, God, you've called for us to reach people that maybe some people in a lifetime will never be able to reach. See, it's not the most talented or able who will make a difference in this world. It's the people who are willing to get off their donkey and choose to do something for Jesus that will have the greatest impact in this life. See, this lawyer asked a question. He says, who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? In other words, hey, what's the box I need to check? Show me the person and I'll go be a neighbor to him. And see, while the lawyer was called up in the who, Jesus was called up in the you. Don't worry about the who. Just allow yourself to become all that it needs to become. You fall in love with my father with everything that you have. And you love every single person that you come in contact with regardless of their circumstance, regardless of their situation. You just put on love. You worry about you, who I'm becoming in your life, how I'm growing you and changing you and breaking you and conforming. You worry about you. You abide in me. You abide in me. Think about all the things Jesus begins to teach as he goes on in the New Testament. You, you hang with me. You abide in me. You put your faith in me. You put your trust in me. He tells them, the world will not know who I am by all the knowledge you have or your church attendance or your status or your title, but the world will know you belong to me by how you love people. The church, sadly, is not known for loving people. We love people who look like us, talk like us, act like us, and vote like us. And that's who we love. We're called to love people. I, I don't see Jesus putting the asterisks beside love. He says we love people. We're not called to change people. We're not called to brainwash people. We're called to love people with a God-like love in such a way that we lead them to the love of God and we allow God to transform and change the heart, which only he has the power to do anyway. And so Jesus is telling a story, and again, he's a master storyteller, and every story he tells has obviously a bigger, a bigger thing at play. And so Jesus is telling a story about a good Samaritan, but really it's a story about Jesus, isn't it? I mean, isn't Jesus really the, the, the good Samaritan for all of us? Here's Jesus, a guy who would be rejected by mankind, rejected by us, who's willing to stop, to give up his time and his life and his resources to serve us, to heal our wounds, to heal our brokenness, to get involved in the mess of our lives, who was willing to stop and not see this as an inconvenience in his life, who saw us as the opportunity to fulfill his father's plan and mission. I mean, it's really just a big picture of what Jesus did for every single one of us. He embraced the brokenhearted. He mends the wounds. He, he comes after those who cry out to him. He got off literally his donkey to give his life for you and for me. Matthew 20, verse 28 says this, even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. He's the example. Jesus has never once asked you to do something he didn't do first, ever, ever. Everything Jesus has asked for us to do as his followers, he was the example of first, and he says, and go and do this, go and do this, go and do as I've done, go and live this way, live this way. So here's what we need to ask God. We need to ask God to help us serve as he has served. God, God, help us serve the world. Help us see opportunities. Help us see people. Help us serve people the way that you have served us. You served us with your life. We should be willing to lay our lives down for him, to do what he's called for us to do, to not be so driven by what we're trying to create that it becomes bigger than ever fulfilling his purpose and mission for us and for his world that he created. Listen, we put a huge emphasis on serving at this church. And we don't put a huge emphasis on the serving because there's any kickback for us. I mean, for us to serve people on Sunday mornings, for us to serve people internationally, for us to serve people in our community, we're not getting any kickback for that. We want to create opportunities for us to begin to see the life and, and see people the way that God does. Not see people as obstacles. But what serving does is it gets you to stop and pull yourself out of your world and begin to see God's world. Let me tell you this, the scariest thing that could ever happen to us. And, and, I, and, I, and I struggle with this. We'll always struggle with this. The scariest thing that could ever happen is when your world becomes the world, right? When our problems and need become greater than anything else, and we get so trapped in this bubble of like all of our stuff is so big, and all of our stuff is so great. I, I can't get involved anywhere else. When our world becomes the world, we lose sight of God's world and God's mission. 
We all got stuff. We all got problems. We're all going to have struggles. We're all going to have hardships and heartaches, right? Jesus desires for us to be able, in the midst of all of those things, to be able to look beyond and to see what's at work, to see what's at stake, to invest in the lives that he's called for us to invest in. Do you see people? Do you see opportunities as inconveniences? Or do you see them as opportunities for God to use you to do something great for him? Last one is this. Followers of Jesus, do whatever it takes. That's the heart of our church, right? I mean, our our vision, whatever it takes to reach people who are far from God. This Samaritan takes a step further. I mean, not only does he stop to help this man, he gets off of his donkey, his animal. He loads this man on this donkey. He leads him into town. He takes him to an end. He puts him up for the night, pays for it, spends the night mending this man's wounds, pouring oil on him, taking care of him, mending him back to health. That morning he gets up, he goes to the innkeeper, gives him some extra money and says, care for him while I'm gone. I'm gonna be back in two days and when I come back through, if he's accruing any more calls, I'll take care of it. I'll take care of it personally. He was willing to make a personal sacrifice to make a difference in this man's life with no thought of getting anything in return. He didn't come back two days later and say, hey, you're indebted to me, you're now my slave. You owe me something. Where's my appreciation? Where's my thank you? Where's my recognition? Could you, could you write a letter to the editor? Could you maybe tweet that out? Could you maybe put that on Instagram? Let everybody know what I've done for you. He doesn't ask for anything, does he? He just comes back and says, I want to check with you. I want to make sure that you have what you need. He was willing to go above and beyond what it took to make sure this man's needs were met. Here at Hope Church, we've always said that we want to be an above and beyond church. We don't want to be a church that just comes in, checks some boxes, and goes home. We want to be a group of people who are willing to go above and beyond ourselves, who are willing to get outside of ourselves and willing to make personal sacrifices. See, anytime we talk about money or time or whatever it is, I say all the time, people, people, man, they just they get so uptight. And really, all of these things, even Jesus speaking to this now, it's really all just issues of the heart. Yeah, it's been abused. I I realize that. And people have beat people up and guilty people for too long. This is all just issues, though, of what your God is and what you're achieving and what you've made more important. And Jesus is backing up and he's saying, time out. This is about using what I've entrusted you with to make a difference for me. I've given it to you. I've given your time and your resources and your influence. I've given your money and your position and your title. I've given it all to you. What are you doing with it? How are you using it for me? I'm not here trying to rob something from you. I want you to respond out of the overflow of what I've done for you. I want you to be so captivated by my love and my grace and my mercy that you can't help but invest your own time and energy and resources to see to it that somebody else receives what you and I have received. This is a a picture of of the mission and vision that God has for every single person who would call themselves followers of his. That would be people that go above and beyond and do whatever it takes. So here's what we need to do. We need to ask God to help us do whatever it takes. God, help me do whatever it takes. God, I got a jaded perspective. I believe the church just wants my money and the church just wants my time. God, break my heart for those things. Stick around here long enough. I I promise you, we'll earn your trust. Nobody here is begging anybody to do anything. And we get to be part of the greatest movement of God that I've ever seen in my lifetime that I call Hope Church. And I get to watch people week in and week out as we come together and we serve passionately. And we give generously. All so that the hope that we have, this hope of the message of Jesus Christ, of what he can offer for our life, this hope of salvation and mercy and grace and second chances and third chances, this hope of forgiveness and this promise of a life beyond this life. I get to give that away. And so, man, I've received this. How could I ever hoard this? How could I ever make anything that I have my thing? It's all God's. I want to use it for his glory and honor. God's not here expecting you to give every waking moment some cult-like way to the church, to give every waking dollar and be broke and, and not have, you know, that's not even in here. He wants you to leverage what you've been given, 
for his mission and his purpose. Jesus closes out this story. He tells it and says, Jesus looked at the crowd. As he looked at the crowd today in verse 37, he says, you go and do likewise. I just shared a story with you of what it looks like to show extreme generosity, extreme love. And what are we supposed to do about it? Go be a neighbor. Go love people. Stop being so divided. I've been in Alamance County for 13 years. This is one of the most racist communities I've ever been in my life. People are so incredibly racist, so divided. Our country is more divided by politics than I've ever seen in my life. Do we really think the hope of the world lies in politics? Do we really believe that? I mean, we're all literally sitting here thinking that like God's in heaven being like, oh, what's going to happen in D.C. this week? I have no idea. And the kingdom of heaven hinges on whether we get a wall or not or whether the government opens back up. I mean, I don't even know what I'm going to do. And we're fighting and bickering and dividing. We got family members in this church that can't even talk to family members over the holidays. We got people who just post the most ridiculous stuff on social media, who say the most ridiculous things to people. And we divide and we divide and we divide and we divide and we're caught up in it and we're caught up in it and we're caught up in it. And all the while, Jesus is like, I just want you to love people. Like seriously, just love people. Love people who don't think like you and look like you. That's really what love looks like. It's easy love when you look like me and act like me and talk like me and believe what I believe in. It's hard love when you and I don't see eye to eye. It's like, I just want you to love people. And so I think God's kind of given us this kind of format to live by. So let me just tell you something. When I serve people and I serve others, it really exposes how selfish of a person that I am. That's really what serving does. It shows how I've made everything about my life and my schedule. And the more that I serve people, the more I desire to serve people. You know what generosity really is? It's really an antidote to greed. It really is. It exposes just how greedy I am when I can't be generous. I can't be generous. Why? Because I got this thing and it's really important. And it's, it's more important than God's thing. <laughs> so I can't be part of it. Because God's thing is not that big of a deal. Now I would never say that. But when I can't be generous, what I'm saying is my thing is so much more important than God's thing. I don't have time for people. I'm just saying my life is more important than the mission God has given me as a follower of Jesus. God, I want to see the way that you want me to see. I want to do what other people aren't willing to do. And I want to be someone who's willing to do whatever it takes to reach people who are far from God to show them your great love. Let's pray together. God, today... We are so thankful that Jesus is our example, that he laid out for us what it looks like to be a follower of his, to love the way that he's called for us to love, to serve the way that he's called for us to serve. God, it's so easy to get complacent, to get caught up in our lives and our worlds, and to not see people, to not see the needs of people, to not see the brokenness and the hurt and the heartache. It's so easy for us to judge people based on a certain situation, political view, economic class, skin color, whatever it might be and to not see people the way that you see us. We are all, all indebted to you for the love that you've shown us. And you don't ask us to pay anything back to you. God, you came to erase our debts, to erase our wrongs, to erase our sins. You sent Jesus to give his life for us. And all of you ask in return is for us to go be an example of our love to everyone else, to receive the love and to give the love. I pray today that we will be givers of hope and love because we've been recipients of hope and love. And that we would live our lives out of the overflow of what you've done for every single one of us. Nobody looking around, I would just say this for just a moment. Maybe you're here today and maybe you've never received the love of God. You've never put your faith and trust in Jesus. Who came to meet you at your greatest point of need. Who came to forgive you of every sin you've ever committed. Who came to show you grace upon grace upon grace upon grace. Today you can begin a relationship with God today. through just receiving what Jesus did for you on the cross. Just cry out to him say, right now, I receive your forgiveness. I receive your grace. Thank you for forgiving me my sins. Thank you for dying on a cross for me. Thank you for coming to, to pay the debt that I owe. Thank you for conquering death and for going to a tomb and rising from the grave. Also, I can have a living relationship with God in heaven. Today, I put my faith in you, my trust in you. I put my life in your hands. Maybe you're here today and you're a follower of Jesus and you know that you've allowed everything in your world to become the most important thing and you've forgotten about the world that God has placed you in and the work he's called for you to do. Maybe God's gonna break your heart today to open your eyes, to open your heart, to open your time and your energy and your resources to be part of his work. Maybe you're here today and you just wanna talk with somebody, pray with somebody. We're gonna have staff available after the service. 
on both sides of the stage that would love to pray with you, talk with you, whatever you need today. God, thank you today that you're in the business of showing great grace to us and mercy to us. God, thank you for never giving up on us. In Christ's name, amen.